such a time as this. And welcome back to such a time as this. I have George Cornell with me again, coming off of the interview he gave, and it was really good. Now, George, out of the interview, there was there was a question that arose in my mind. You said you were baptized at seven, rededicated at twenty-one, and then at forty-three, you. I don't know how you want to call it, came to the Lord and it really got the peace of the Lord and started working. So how do you reconcile the baptism at seven, the rededication at 21, and then not till 43, the true walking in newness of life? Well, when I was seven, I really genuinely believed in Jesus. I may not have fully understood everything, mm -hmm. but I was sincere in that decision. Mm -hmm. At 21, when I left florida and went back to tennessee i decided to give rededicate my life to christ because i thought maybe god will wash away the gay <laughs> as we often hear mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i got saved and got rebaptized again and i felt really good and i thought oh i finally have peace but within about three to four weeks after that the depression and the struggle was back and i couldn't take it anymore and i just said i cannot live life like this any longer and to me suicide was the only way that i thought i could just get peace mm -hmm and attempted it, but thank God I lived uh -huh. through it. So at 43, when I truly rededicated my life to Christ, I knew fully what I was doing this time. And I understood sin. I understood the life that I had led. And I truly understood repentance mm -hmm. and really going to God and saying, I have um, failed you. And it was, to me, that was my real, true, genuine conversion i believe because of what god had done in my life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you said there was an incident when you were in your 20 when i was in fort lauderdale i was around 20 years old i was getting ready to go into a gay bar and i had several friends around me and as we were walking in it was as if the lord turned down the volume of, of everyone around me and i heard it as plain as day him speaking to me and saying if you were to die tonight would you go to hell and it was a, a whisper but it was powerful and it stopped me in my tracks. And at that time, and I wasn't even thinking about God. I wasn't in church. I was away from family. I had no godly influence in my life, but why God would choose to speak to me at that time really was jolting. In hindsight, having dismissed his voice, I thank God that he was patient and gracious and allowed me to continue on that path of wickedness to get to where I am today and was patient with me because if I had died that night, I really don't know where I would have spent eternity. I really don't. Mm. And thank God we don't have to, uh, at least in your case, there's, there's no question about it. Whether you were at seven, whether you were at 21, you definitely were at 43. So we don't mm -hmm. have that. But for those, uh, in your case, that's not a question. But there is a question for others who are struggling, who are in the lifestyle, who have been baptized at seven, who rededicated their lives in their teens, but they're still living in the lifestyle, still, still clinging to the lifestyle, and but they think they're genuinely saved. It's tough, again, we're not, none of us, you nor I know, no one else here on earth presently will sit on that judgment seat and judge. But if we were to live out the gospel if we were to understand the gospel in john 14 jesus says he who has my commandments and keep them he is the one who loves me he who has my commandments and does not keep them does not love me what do you say to those who are st struggling with the lifestyle living in, uh, in the lifestyle but yet have these liberal christians will tell you or i say liberal christians the liberal ideology that says you don't have to leave the lifestyle you're fine Mm -hmm. You're fine. You're going to heaven, yet they cling to that lifestyle. What, I mean, what, 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 what do you say to them? First of all, a lot of LGBT individuals in that community will attack me. They'll accuse me of being a self-loathing homosexual, and I'm a Judas, and I'm a traitor, and I get all the hate and the curses, and they, you know, blaspheme God and everything. I just get a bunch of hate. Now, what you so, self-loathing. What do you mean self-loathing homosexual? What they're saying is, is, oh, you just, you can't come to, to terms and be at peace with being a homosexual, and because you loathe yourself, therefore, you can't except being a homosexual. Okay, okay. So you hate yourself. Okay. So that's your problem. Okay. I want them to know 
I slept with hundreds of men and I'm not bragging this. That was my life. I lived out my sexuality. I, I did what I wanted, the drugs, the alcohol, everything. But what I would say to them is this. I went to God when I was trying to get an answer to this. And I said, God, if this is truly okay to be a homosexual, I'm going to trust you. you'll not only give me peace with it, but you'll put a good Christian man in my life. And that was my dream and my desire, as I said in the other interview. But I also told God, if it is wrong and it is not your will and not in your design, I'm still going to serve you. Then that was the honest to God truth. And that may have been the first time you honestly started the, the submission process, the repentance mm -hmm. process, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And it was called surrendering. Yes. And that's what I did. I surrendered yes. my life to Christ and I surrendered, surrendered my own, my own desires, selfish desires yes. and living for self. Yes. Yes. Because until the LGBT community understands what, how seriously God takes sin, and what Jesus truly endured on the cross, until they really look at Calvary, for me, I saw that what Jesus had to endure to pay for my sin and my wickedness, Jesus denying himself, not wanting to go to the cross, even asked God, is there another way we can do this? But God said, no, this is the way. And Jesus was still obedient. How is it that we feel that we can live the life that we want and do as we want? And I'm talking to heterosexuals too. Yeah, if you think jacking up, having sex out of marriage and having babies out of wedlock and dressing provocatively and gossiping in the church and doing witchcraft, drugs, all of that stuff. You can't go twerk at the club on Friday night and then expect <laughs> to go in on Sunday morning and God to bless you. Yeah, It's not going to work that way. Yeah. So for me, I realized it's like this. I would say to the LGBT individual, mm -hmm. being a homosexual doesn't send you to hell any more than being a heterosexual is an automatic ticket to heaven. Correct. We know that it is the rejection of Christ that sends a person to hell. Correct. But if you claim to be a Christian, God is clear. He does chastise his children. And I paid a price for my sin and my wickedness. And I'm warning them. You may stay in that life and you may believe what people are saying. But who I don't care what people think or what society feels or what you feel. All that matters is what God says. And if God says do A, B, C, and D, you better do it. And if he says don't do A, B, C, and D, you better not do it. And that's the only way you're going to have peace and a true walk with Christ and to have his blessings by truly obeying God and his word. And I would say to them, it may seem difficult for you to come out of that life and feel like, well, I'm going to lose everything and I don't, and I don't feel uh, an attraction towards someone of the opposite sex because I now have been on the path of celibacy for over 13 years. But I want them to know God will fill the void of what you hmm. lose on the other side. Hmm. And I couldn't see it then, but I'm so grateful. I stuck with hmm. God because I see the work that he has been doing in my life and the peace that he has given me. And I want them to know no man no 30 minute romp in the sack is worth going to hell for. So I, for me, I just had to have a good wake up call. And by the grace of God, he allowed me to get to a point of where I wallowed in that misery for so long. I have no desire to go back into that life. So is it, is it your opinion that a large majority of those who are living in the lifestyle and attending liberal churches they're miserable. Are you saying there's, there's a struggle there? Yes, and I'm going to tell you why. I hear from LGBT individuals all around the world, and they tell me how miserable they are, and they want out of that life. And just like me, we mm -hmm. don't know that there are success stories because the media will not yes. tell our stories. Yes. It's always the pro-gay stuff. But I want those LGBT individuals to understand we, I'm going to put myself in the community for a moment, but my identity is now in Christ, not in my sexuality. Correct. Good. Yeah, but yeah. when I was in the life, I thought that I was miserable because of Christians. And I want them to understand that you could kill every Christian. You could destroy every Bible, <laughs> could enact all of the hate laws that you want. You will never have peace being in rebellion against what God deems rebellion and sin and wickedness. You cannot run from the true living God. So your, your lack of peace is not because of Christians or people not accepting you or your family saying this or however you're treated, you're not going to have peace hmm. because God's not going to give you peace. Wow. And this goes for heterosexuals as well, who Absolutely. are doing things they know they shouldn't. Absolutely. And so 
we got a few more minutes here. Help me out. When you go to a church that is that is pro LGBT, what do they open the Bible? Do they read the scriptures? How do they deal with God's word that clearly states his view on it? I mean, how, how, how does that work? I, I, I've always been curious because every person I've run across who say the Bible is pro LGBTQ and every time I set up and I've done this several times, I've set up a meeting with them. They don't show up. Right. So what, what happens? Go ahead. They conveniently leave out the full context of the scripture. And that's why in the back of my book, I take a lot of the talking points and I'll give you a couple just real quickly. If we have time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we okay. got time. We've got about four minutes. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. They'll say David and Jonathan were homosexuals. Yeah, I've heard that. That's one thing you'll hear. But this is my question. If it was truly a homosexual relationship, there are no instances of homosexual relationships defined in God's word. In that culture, men could be um, affectionate toward each other. Unlike in America, we're so uptight. Men can't yeah, yeah, yeah. hug and kiss on each other. You know, women can and nobody questions it. But let a man hug a brother and they're suddenly having sex in the park. You know, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Christian men can bond and it doesn't have to be sexual. Yeah. But if it was truly a homosexual relationship, that would have been the perfect opportunity for God to define that and show us what a homosexual, a God-centered relationship looked like. Yeah. But he did and, and then they'll say, well, Jesus was gay, and that's why he hung around men. Whoa. But he didn't come out of the closet because he was afraid of homophobia. So Jesus will get in the face of the Pharisees who were trying to kill him and tell them exactly what he thought. But he was suddenly afraid of being called a fag. Again, it's the nonsense. They stretch it. Is this it. common, George? That they're saying that Jesus was a homosexual? This is mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, I could tell you numerous ways that they, they twist God's word. And that's why I debunk all of it in my book, because it was that was what kept me in such confusion, because I didn't know what to believe anymore. And I want to tell the LGBT community, until you sit down and you get into God's word and you stop listening to me or you or the liberal pastors or society or Hollywood or the mm -hmm. media, mm -hmm. it is your responsibility to sit down and find the truth for yourself. And that's what I did, because I was so hungry, not only for truth. But this was the battle of my mind. And I was I was it was either kill myself or completely surrender my life to Christ. So from queer to Christ by the book, we're going to I'm going to get the book soon and I'm going to read this book. This is I don't have a lot of time to read. Book. I'm going to read this one mm -hmm. and we're going to constantly refer to this because this is one of the issues. This is the tip of the spear. This this is the 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 issue that the enemy's going to use. And, and let me say this, George, because we got about we got about two minutes. I have a theory. I have a theory. There are a lot of sins throughout recorded history that men have engaged in. There's only one recorded in the scriptures, Sodom and Gomorrah, that was talked about. There's a lot of sins in the culture in Paul's day, but at the first chapter in the book of Romans, he chooses to highlight that once they reject truth, he highlights the one sin of homosexuality that then corrupts the rest of the culture. And I have a theory. I think, and I want to we'll get your input on this. I think that throughout recorded history, the enemy knows if he can get a culture to swallow the sexual sins, to swallow the homosexual sin, he doesn't have to deal with lying and murder. If you swallow that one sin, it'll corrupt the rest of the culture. Mm -hmm. And I think you see that pattern throughout scripture that he, he'll give you whatever, just swallow this sin. And I think throughout history, you've seen it in Athens was big, Sparta. You look throughout, I, I love history, I'm a history buff. And the societies that seemingly embraced it seemingly degraded mm -hmm. to their demise. And I think that's why when Paul says in Romans, although they knew God, they saw it not fit to acknowledge him as God. He's, Paul is now looking at, and he's talking about all the cultures and the countries that came before him mm -hmm. that corrupted and descended. And he chose to highlight that one sin. What, 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 is, your, what is your view on that? George? I would say real quickly mm -hmm. to the LGBT community, 
the liberal theologians will always drive home God's grace. But notice they never talk about the judgment. Yes. When I tell you God hates sin, he hates it so much that it cost him the life of his son. Yes. You better start listening to God and stop listening to the lies. Yeah. Not going to have peace until you do. And that that is great. Thanks a lot, George. Thanks again. We'll be back again. But this is again, we're going to do this hopefully for as long as George will keep coming back on giving insight into the tip of the spear. This is how for such a time as this going to deal with this issue with love. And, mm -hmm. and I want to be very Thanks. clear. I love homosexuals, love mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. homosexuals, lesbians, transgender. I love them. And, and here's what we always say, George, on for such a time as this. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Yes, I love you enough, and love is telling you the truth, and we love them. So thank you, thanks again, George, for, for, for a great me. time with us. Thanks again, people. See you soon. For such a time as this.